thank you so much, Rosa, um, for that introduction and for inviting me. And thank you to everyone at Sonic Access. As many of the speakers have said, this has been an incredibly like lovely event to be a part of. And I, you know, am admittedly a little bit intimidated to be following so many excellent speakers and proceeding who will, uh, what will likely be an excellent talk. I'm going to be talking um, about one sp specific project that I did last year and kind of sticking as much to that as possible. And I titled this talk Forever Noon on a Cloudless Day, which is kind of how it feels to look at the world um, in a web browser in kind of what is commonly and what I'll be referring to mostly as the satellite base map. And there are a few different companies that provide a satellite base map. Um, Google is one, Bing is another. This one is from a company called Mapbox. I have a particular affinity for this satellite base map because I have a friend who works on it. And he said something in an article about, about this work once that I think a lot about, which is that this is a picture of what people think the world is supposed to look like. And it's true, right? You wouldn't look at a base map and expect to have like gaps in it. But you know, the world, the world has time zones and the world has clouds. The world is very cloudy, right? And the process of making that kind of perfect base map where like you can kind of zoom from one place to another and it's more or less the same lighting everywhere you go is a process really of kind of accumulating many moments over time and filtering the white bits out, right? Um, like there's there's probably never really been a moment in like the history of the planet where there wasn't a cloud over what is you know now England, and yet when looking at a base map, it's this kind of perfect cloudless mass. Um, and when this process was first kind of explained to me, I found it kind of weirdly poetic insofar as it's this idea of history sort of being collapsed into this single kind of like ideal version of a place. Um, and also sort of unnerving. I don't know. I, I, a lot of my work is telling stories about places, and I go to places. And my, my big frustration is kind of trying to reconcile the histories of landscapes with kind of their absence or kind of aura. This is a thing my friend Aaron Cope said in a talk I made him give in an event a few years ago. And I think about it a lot because in some ways what I try to do and often fail at or demonstrate the failure of doing is trying to reconcile different histories with each other um, or take histories that have been kind of broken up by time and show the ways in which they were part of the same moment in various ways. Um, and doing that through landscape, particularly for the history of technology, I think is important because technology kind of rhetorically wants to kind of unmoor itself from landscape and from history and from accountability. Um, so. With that in mind, um, about a year and a half ago, I got asked if I wanted to do a show in a gallery in Berlin, which is not a thing I normally do. Looking back on my CV, most of the shows I've been in have also doubled as all-age punk venues. Um, maybe this means I am losing my edge. I am not sure. But um, when out, it seemed kind of like an interesting challenge, right? Um, and what would I put in a big, empty room? Um, stories about places. And I, I wanted to, I, this, this thing about kind of this like cloudless world um, had been bothering me for a while and I wanted to do something with it. So I turned to a very analog approach to thinking about that problem um, to try and slow down that process. If you have not heard of a lenticular print, you have probably seen one and not known that it was called that. It's basically a very simple optical illusion. They were kind of popularized as these cheap sort of cards you might find in like a dollar store. And the trick is basically to kind of slit scan images two or more together into this like single flat plane and then put a layer of lenses on top of them. And then basically depending on where you stand to look at the image, the lens going to, is going to kind of like affect the light hitting it. So you'll see one image over the other. So I did, made nine uh, one meter by one meter lenticular prints of different sites using um, a mix of historical satellite imagery Google Maps, screenshot, Google Maps screenshots and various other sources. Um, and this really was kind of just a way to unearth different stories about places, right? This is what I do. I do stories about places. And I'm going to tell you some of those stories, not all of them. And hopefully, I won't go over time in doing that. So there were three sort of themes that I, I kind of ended up working with. Um, and there were three images kind of to each theme. And the first one were places that had some kind of roll in or, or told a piece of the story of the legacy of this, you know, what St. Donna, who has been invoked many times at this conference, refers to as kind of the God's eye view from nowhere. Um, and 
you know, of course, this largely meant looking at, in a US context, a lot of kind of the legacy of, you know, the military industrial complex and the role of that in kind of the development of satellite, spy satellites. Um, I'm not even going to explain that previous slide. Um, so this is an image, um, and just because, just in case my explanation of how a lenticular print works didn't quite work, they do that. You get it? I hope you do. Um, so this is an image from 2006 um, near Moffett Field in Sunnyvale, California, which you could you know, say is kind of encompassed within the general area of Silicon Valley. And the area that we're kind of most interested in here is that big corner right over here. So that building um, is the Sunnyvale Air Force Station, also colloquially referred to as the Blue Cube, um, named so because it was a giant blue cube. It was built in 1960, um, and it was torn down in 2014. This is an image from 2015. Um, the Blue Cube is mostly significant to the history of satellite imaging because um, it was one, like, kind of an important Department of Defense, like, site for kind of processing um, spy satellites and military satellite communications. Um, it claims, like they're in a deeply cached dot mil page I found on the Internet Archive, to be kind of the, the birthplace of the Corona program. I think that's not actually entirely true or fair, um, because the Corona program was cited in many places in Silicon Valley, but it, you know, there was going to be kind of an official heir to its legacy. You could do worse. The Corona program was basically the United States' first effort at spy satellites. We'd had sort of spy planes doing kind of aerial reconnaissance, um, but this was kind of the first effort to put something in space to take pictures so that we could figure out how many nukes the Russians had. Um, and this is not a site that's going to get a commemorative plaque for that history. This is a thing that kind of what led, like Silicon Valley is not really good at acknowledging. And I don't know, as someone who has spent a fair amount of time in that area, it sort of frustrates me that Technology criticism tends to treat Silicon Valley not as a geography, but as an ideological condition. Um, it is, in fact, a place, and that place has all of these weird complexities and legacies that don't get told very well. This next image is um, one in which not very, ac very much actually happens, other than maybe like kind of a change in color which is weirdly satisfying in and of itself. But the fact that nothing happens is in this particular kind of image is partly due to, is kind of by design. So um, this is um, outside of like, within like kind of a dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California. Um, in 1991, the uh, START Treaty, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, required the United States and Russia to um, get rid of what they called um, strategic nuclear delivery vehicles which basically means planes. Um, and there was this process by which the, both sides kind of had to verify that the other had kind of held up their end of the bargain, right? Um, and the process of kind of figuring out how are we going to do this was referred to in, all of, in the treaty as um, the national technical means. Because at that point, a lot of these spy satellite programs were still classified, and both sides knew the others had spy satellites, but they couldn't like acknowledge it. So they used this like weirdly diplomatic language to say, look, fly your spy satellites over our bases, and you can see all the planes we busted up and aren't working anymore. Um, and I actually, like, this is kind of apocrypha. I think it's actually only one of those two B-52s is a casualty of the START Treaty. The other one might have been dead for quite a while. But there is something weirdly comforting or bookending about, you know, a technology originally created to count and verify, like, kind of the weapons on one, like, on the other side being used to verify the decommissioning of them. And of course, the Cold War isn't really over. It never really was. This is a whole other conversation. Next set of images um, that I'm going to talk a little about um, are places that were sort of deliberately obscured or altered in the um, satellite base map that normal internet users might run into, um, which really actually just meant one kind of set of images. So there were three of them, but I'm only showing you one. And it's a set of images that many of you, I imagine, are quite familiar with. Um, so the Dutch military, at some point, I think this is probably around 2006, made this agreement with Google about camouflaging and hiding certain kind of strategically important military sites. This is Volkel Air Base. Um, and lots of countries do this. There are lots of places in the Google kind of landscape that are a little glitched out or have old imagery or that kind of are like hard to see. And that's very common. The thing that's weird about 
the Dutch ones is that they have this specific aesthetic that I've read described as like somebody found out about the crystallized filter in Photoshop and kind of just went to town. Um, it also kind of supposedly looks a little bit like Dutch camouflage. Um, this is the sort of like, we've talked a lot about science fiction and for anyone who's read um, William Gibson's Blue Ant trilogy, this feels like the sort of thing the arch villain of that series would have come up with. All right, maybe not. Um, but uh, so there's you know a few different sites like this. Mishka Henner did a series kind of cataloging all of the different sites. The thing that's also kind of weird about it is that other services censor it in completely different ways and don't seem to care about you know this Dutch brand identity that seemed very important in the Google context. This is um, from Bing. And I also like the negotiations of how to hide things in public imagery is like a conversation I would love to be a fly on the wall for because that is not like less conspicuous, right? Like I wonder where the rumored nuclear missiles that are thought to be at Volcal Air Base can be. It can't possibly be that black hole in the middle of the landscape. Um, not that, you know, the crystal filter does it any better. Um, and then the last set of places that were part of this, this series are places without which in a way, um, I would even kind of be having this like itch to like poke at satellite imagery. Um, by which I mean, um, it was mostly a set of three different images of different Google data centers. And I do a lot of other work related to network infrastructure and have a lot of ambivalence about the sort of data center as new fetish object. Like I, I worry that there is an appeal towards, you know, replacing the abstraction of the cloud with the like concrete materiality of the data center just kind of gives us a new box that we cannot comprehend. Um, not to mention most of our like visuals of it are kind of on the terms of the companies that are creating them. That being said, they are like kind of fascinating objects. Um, and Google kind of more than any other company has normalized this view from above. I, I told a friend who used to work at NASA um, that he, I told him my, that opinion and he got really upset. And I, so I should say NASA was largely significant to Google being able to do that, but sorry, Rob. Um, but uh, the other reason that kind of Google's data centers were, seemed like an interesting kind of subject to spend some time staring at, um, aside from the fact that like I've been to most of the ones that were in this series or at least stood outside them and then been politely told to leave, is that um, there's this rumor. And I've only seen two things that suggest that it's true, um, but that doesn't kind of stop me from like picking at it, which is that Google had a longstanding policy that apparently no longer exists of hiding their data centers in their satellite imagery um, or in their base map. This is the only instance I've personally run into. The other example um, that I've seen was a screenshot from Andrew Bloom, who's a journalist who's done work on network infrastructure. Um, and so this is in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Um, there are two Google data centers in that area. This was the site of the second one. And this is what um, that site looked like in Google Maps um, in 2015 and in 2016, both times that I drove out to see that data center, which exists. Um, the thing is, this is imagery from like USGS from 2014. So they had the, you know, the imagery was around and it kind of didn't get updated. And there are lots of reasons why imagery probably doesn't get updated. But this, this real, this kind of itchy feeling that like this thing is, it should be there, but is not kind of couldn't leave my mind. Um, and the fact that I think in a way, like the, the point of the story of Google hiding its data centers is not so much to like point a finger and say like, behold, you did a wrong thing because like, it's not really clear what we lose by not being able to see the data centers. But I think the fact that you realize that like, they obviously could and no one would know and no one would care because how many people are going to look at Council Bluffs, Iowa at any given point besides me. Um, of course, within like shortly after all of the files for this project were sent to the printer, they updated the imagery with the data center in it. <laughs> um, although not everywhere. Um, so on the right, that's um, Google Maps with the you know, magnificent data center intact. That's uh, the co.uk Google Maps, which I screenshotted a couple of days ago. And I, again, like this sense of kind of like the inconsistency of the base map across spaces is probably has more to do with the fact that like corporations are really busy um, and kind of incoherent. And you know, there isn't necessarily like a master plan to these things. But this idea that there is a base map, the idea that, that the satellite view, um, you know, the, 
you know, St. Donna's God's eye view from nowhere could have some sense of like unity and coherence is something that I think is worth remembering is kind of a fiction. Um, so that was some work that I made in 2016. Um, that project wrapped up in September and I did it and I kind of, this is the first time I've actually really talked about that work um, because a bunch of other stuff happened um, in my, my broken country. And I haven't really, I've been sort of trying to figure out how to talk about it, right? Cause it's quite, you know, it's whimsical and kind of to the side. Um, and I guess the, this is maybe more of a joke than anything else. I've been thinking a lot about kind of the view from above in its many forms. This is a photo I took after the election, a couple of days after the election. Um, and I think a lot about those, those retail workers uh, far, far enjoying their view from nowhere, um, which is always somewhere, right? It's always positioned, it's always something specific, and it is not kind of you know, free from the limits and responsibilities of the world. Um, and you know, again, I tell stories about places, and what I'm mostly trying to do is kind of maintain a link to the histories that tend to disappear in landscape because landscapes change all the time. So maybe what I should have been showing you this whole time, instead of the like optical illusion piece of those pieces, was actually these kind of messy versions, which happen when you stand just at the wrong point with them, or maybe just at the right point, when these different kinds of timelines sort of collapse in on each other, and you can't really figure out what you're looking at. Um, which seems maybe more like a sincere way of talking about what it is to try and figure out how to be in the world. Um, a lot of people have been saying in, in art and culture context now more than ever after making statements like that. Um, and it's maybe more of a now as it has always been. Thank you.